All right. Uh, so it's um, it's five. It's actually five oh two. So um, uh, it's good to see everybody. Thanks for getting on. Um, I thought the meeting two weeks ago was really really good. Amanda um, Brock is on this call. Um, so uh, I see her on there. She's muted right now, but she's listening. Obviously, we had um, lots of good information from Amanda two weeks ago. And if there's questions from today, um, then obviously, if Amanda's still on, you can ask her. But uh, Eric Bowder was nice enough uh, with the um, Sheriff's Department. And, and Eric, tell me exactly what your title is. And you should probably unmute. That would be helpful. There you go. I was ha I'm sorry. I was having computer problems. That's okay. Uh, I'm the director of the Behavioral Care Center uh, with yeah. the Metro Nashville Sheriff's Office. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to make sure I write that down. All right. So Eric was nice enough last time to actually listen to us, listen to Amanda uh, for an hour. And uh, because Eric uh, was supposed to have half the time, we, he was nice enough to say he would get back on and talk to us today. So today we have uh, an hour to... Um, for Eric to kind of explain how, how that works, what he does uh, on behalf of the Sheriff's Department. A lot of it is tied into what Amanda does. Um, and then um, Eric, if you don't mind just giving us kind of like a 15, 20 minute, whatever you want in terms of kind of how this works, how the center works, what do you do? Um, make sure we're clear on that. And then we'll open up for questions and answers. And if Amanda's still on, we'll just kind of share the floor and listen. And I will say, um, it's been a busy couple of weeks, I'm sure for everybody, but I know that um, Elise was sending out some information that I think she sent out to some folks. Um, Elise, did we, was there any additional information that came from the Sheriff's Department that uh, you sent out to everybody? See if Elise can unmute. Okay, uh, no, there, there was not. Uh, Ms. Weedner, Haley uh, asked for some information in the email, which I forgot to send to the sheriff uh, last week, but I believe they connected. Will you ask her? Can she hear me? If they Hallie, can you? Hallie's on. Hallie, can you hear Elise? Yeah, hear we. Yeah, I talked to Sheriff Paul this morning. Is he going to okay. send send you some stuff? Or yeah, he you? sent me um, a grant that they're uh, they applied for. They haven't found out that they've gotten it yet, though. But you asked for a bunch of other stuff too. Yeah. Um, we kind of talked through that. I had a lot of questions about outcomes and um, programming um, within uh, Davidson County Jail. And um, basically outcomes are difficult to track is kind of what, excuse my dog. <laughs> um, stop it. Uh, is kind of what he told me. Um, she she agrees. Uh, it's kind of what he told me um, this morning um, because there really is no follow up um, with uh, people who come in and out of jail unless they come back in um, and get rearrested. But there's not like it's not like there's case management um, within the uh, sheriff's department after they leave unless you know and so he kind of was saying that it's kind of hard to um track outcomes that work um that way which was a big question i had just because um i was curious as to what is working and what is not um and but the grant that they're um, that they are applying for um, will give them uh, like a two year. Well, do that. It's like this. Um, it's Falcon is the organization that it's called, and um, they will track um, people who go in and out of Davidson County Jail, and um, and we'll see like what programs and they have all of the equipment and resources and time to do that. Um, and it's a two year grant. So that would be really exciting if Davidson County does get it. Okay. That's actually um, kind of interesting. It may be, I don't know if Eric knows anything about it. He might want to touch on it if he does. If not, um, 
I'd be interested in talking more about it maybe at a subsequent meeting because I think that's probably important. So um, anyway, Kelly, thanks for uh, that information. I hadn't heard about that. Okay. Um, well, uh, unless somebody else has something, um, I'm going to turn it over to Eric and let him kind of talk about his program. So um, sure. Eric, it's all yours. Okay. Great. Thank you all uh, for letting me be here and talk a little bit about the behavioral care center that we have here in Nashville. Um, obviously with the COVID, we would have loved to have done a grand opening so that we can invite, invite everyone, including people like yourself, uh, to show it off uh, in person. And hopefully we'll get to do that um, very soon, get everybody here. Um, like you said, uh, Amanda was on last week talking about the Christ, uh, Crisis uh, Treatment Center. Um, and uh, Vice Mayor, you are correct. Uh, the mental health co-op does have a lot to do with what is going on at the Behavioral Care Center. If uh, some of you don't know, we we contract out for our medical provider uh, there at the at the sheriff's office with WellPath, um, and they're our medical provider. They subcontract the mental health services uh, through Mental Health Co-op, and the Mental Health Co-op obviously has been with us for for quite some time, uh, Amanda would probably be able to tell you the exact date of your year that they've been with what, with us, but I've been with the Sheriff's Office for 28 years and the mental health co-op has always been a part of what we have going on there at the jail. So part of that I, I, I like because there's um, some consistency in, in the data that is collected the Mental Health Cooperative uh, has been collecting data on, on individuals who come into the justice system for quite some time. And so they have an idea of uh, their mental health capacity on the front end. Um, part of what Amanda was talking about, the, the crisis, crisis Treatment Center allows the Metro Police Department, as you all know, to, to, to drop, to, to take someone to that is in a mental health crisis. Um, the, Obviously, as you as you as most of you know, the, the jail is the the quote, I guess the other alternative for something where the Metro Police Department doesn't have an option per se to take them to the crisis treatment center. So they went they they wind up um, going through the the arrest uh, uh, booking process, you know, and uh, the arrest booking process uh, includes, as most of you know, mugshot, fingerprint, all of that. Um, Something we have now that we haven't had before um, is master's level mental health intake screeners. Uh, used to, uh, we had mental health cooperative was there during the during mostly the daytime hours. Now we have 24 seven coverage in booking uh, where the arrests are actually coming in um, doing the, the actual um, assessments uh, on individuals who have uh, a mental health condition. Part of, uh, you know, the Behavioral Care Center, it's a diversion program and there is criteria to get yourself or to, to be able to volunteer yourself to go over to the program. Uh, you have to have a misdemeanor charge. Uh, you have to have a mental health uh, slash substance use disorder. And of course the master's level uh, mental health um, individuals in booking will diagnose that or will, will be able to capture that. Um, and what happens on my end in the Behavioral Care Center is we have a referral list um, that is generated on third shift. So the referral list is a list of individuals who, who are, have misdemeanor charges and have a mental health capacity where the, where the intake specialist or intake mental health specialist believes they would be a good candidate for the Behavioral Care Center. Um, Early on in the process, we, we did a lot of work with the district attorney's office uh, and the public defender's office, uh, Glenn Funk and Marticia. Um, and they designated two individuals who, who are assigned to the behavioral care center. So we have a district attorney, assistant district attorney in um, uh, Jordan Hoffman and uh, public defender Kyle Morris. Uh, and we have what we call reviews every morning, Monday through Friday. Um, they start at 7.30 in the morning. It's myself, uh, a representative, uh, Lacey Monday, who's the program manager for the Mental Health Cooperative, and Jordan Hoffman, who's the DA, and Kyle Morris. And we basically look, go over the referral list. Uh, the DA decides whether or not they're a good candidate, uh, yes or no. 
and the the public defender decides if they're a good candidate, yes or no. And of course, Lacey does uh, decides whether they're a good mental health fit for the behavioral care center. Uh, and I'm there um, as a, a, a sheriff's office representative. I can look at past history if they've been incarcerated before to see if they might be a good or good candidate for the behavioral care center. So that's kind of how the initial initial uh, like to get to the behavioral care center, that's how we, um, that's how we um, get residents into the behavioral care center. We are a um, licensed uh, residential facility with the state. We just had our first audit last Thursday uh, and it went, it went very well. And uh, we're a 60 bed, a 60 resident facility, 30 male, 30 female. Uh, the max stay in uh, the behavioral care center is 30 days. Um, the mental health, uh, something a little different too. And what, we were, what we're trying to do with this is trying to decriminalize the mental health, uh, mental health aspect of it. And having the DA on board, the DA is, is able to make a decision early on and keep the actual charge out of the judicial system. Uh, individuals that come through our program, their charges are nollied by the DA and the public defender expunges the charges. So it really benefits uh, the individuals that come through our program. And, you know, we've had some success stories. I think a couple of them were on the flyer that I, I might have uh, uh, sent to you, but we've had a, a few more since then, uh, especially the individuals that, you know, might come in on a, as a first time offender. Um, and their charges, uh, you know, obviously are nollied and then uh, expunged. But one of the good things about um, having, having this is it's not a judge, it's not the DA deciding how long the resident is staying at the Behavioral Care Center. The uh, mental health cooperative, Lacey uh, Monday and her staff um, determine, uh, using their assessment tools, determine uh, the area of focus for the individuals, the treatment for the individuals, and the mental health cooperative decides how long an individual stays there. So I might, you know, with my uh, treatment plan, I might be staying there five or six days. Someone else might be there 15. Another might be there 30 days. Uh, but they, the mental health cooperative uses their assessment tools to determine the, the length of stay. Um, some of the things that, that, that happen while they're there, they obviously get individual therapy, group therapy. Um, we're doing MAT now, which is uh, medicated assistant treatment, uh, which is something new. Um, uh, and also we have discharge planning. So uh, the discharge planning obviously has wraparound services. Um, uh, the, the sheriff might have mentioned in previous uh, meetings maybe with you guys uh, that we don't want to release anyone to the streets. So everybody uh, through the discharge planner gets released to either a provider or a family member or someone. Uh, and that's, that's the key there. And some of the, um, you know, something that Haley was mentioning uh, uh, earlier, and I hate to keep babbling on here, but, uh, you know, the, the discharge planners, one of the responsibilities of the discharge planner is to do a 30, 60, and 90 day follow up. So that's something that that is there. And then, you know, obviously we've only been doing this since mid October um, with the COVID and the win the winter months. Uh, you know, our numbers aren't exactly where we would we would love them to be, but there things are ramping up, and we're hoping to help more and more um, more and more people. So I don't know if um, that kind of explains things. Um, but I don't know if anybody has any questions. I can go into detail on some other things as well. So I'm, I'm checking the chat box, <clears throat> not, nothing in there. Um, let's just look, who's got, uh, Jennifer, I think you have a, your hand up, go ahead. Um, yeah, so for the uh, therapeutic services, do you all have a, a specific modality that you use and do you do any kind of addressing um, for any kind of trauma history or is the trauma history something that you would refer out? Yeah, it's it's actually, um, we're, the, the, and I didn't do a great job explaining the, the hierarchy, I guess, of the behavioral care center. Uh, I did a little bit, I touched on it a little bit where WellPath is the medical provider. So we have medical in there that, that that WellPath is over, and then we have um, 
uh, mental health cooperative who's over the clinical part of it. And then of course we have the sheriff's office who are over the actual technicians that are that are actually working in there. But we, they are, or, or the clinical part of it is trauma-informed care. So that, that is part of um, the, 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 the treatment um, that, I, that I touched on briefly uh, is the target area of, of focus is trauma-informed. And then, so quick follow-up then with the MAT services, is I'm assuming while they're in, while they're in the facility that it's covered through the county dollars, and so do you have a way to facilitate continuing on the medication assisted treatment post discharge? That's and it. then I guess from a numbers perspective, have you been able to tell yet if folks have been able to to maintain that resource? Yeah, we have just started the the MAT program, and I touched base with Lacey, and Lacey explained to me um, the individuals, uh, like I said, have to be um, uh, sent to a provider. The provider has to have the MAT program, so the the individuals that are are in in the the medicated assistant treatment at the behavioral care center, they have to go to a provider that also uh, has uh, medicated assistant treatment. Jennifer, follow up. No, that's all I got for right now. Thanks. Um, let me uh, uh, let me ask you a question, Eric. In, in light of what Jennifer's asking, um, um, I know this. Uh, you've been doing this for a while, but the the new center has been open since October. Am I saying that right? Was yeah, there a the program before you actually? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't had so a we me, haven't had uh, a program like we haven't had a program like this before. No, this okay. is we've just been uh, in op, uh, up in operation since uh, mid October. Okay, so obviously it's pretty early, but uh, we're talking about March, so it's been open roughly five months. Um, are you keeping up with the data to determine? Um, and again, it's early. How successful? It is, so I think Jennifer's yeah. point is well taken. You release somebody with a discharge plan, they gotta make sure that they get released to the right place. And obviously there's a treatment program. Have you, are you seeing it successful so far? I, I know it's early, but yeah, it's, are you yeah, also it's... seeing people come back in who haven't been able to, who haven't been able to make it through the program outside and come back in and you're finding out kind of what's going on? You know, yeah, why, why it's, yeah, we, we yeah. To answer your question, yes. Uh, early on, we knew that uh, we would want to uh, uh, have outcome measures. We have a with WellPath and Mental Health Cooperative. We have a, a long list of outcome measures that we're tracking. Uh, right now, we're tracking a six percent uh, recidivism. Uh, so we have seen individuals uh, come back. Um, that's kind of where we're at um, right now. But to answer your question, is yes, we we are tracking data. We know that's important for the success of the program, and uh, we're anxious, you know, obviously to get some, you know, months and years under our belt uh, to to be able to help uh, and assist uh, these things. And some of those recidivism, that six percent that I mentioned, included everybody. Um, we to to build to start building the program. We have moved over individuals who are like currently incarcerated, like may, might be in on a convicted misdemeanor or might be in mental health court or might be in recovery court. And they're, you know, if they're, if they're the length of their sentence, if they're within the 30 days, we can move them over to the behavioral care center and, you know, allow them to get, you know, more treatment, uh, treatment focused help uh, more so than what they get on the jail side, if that makes sense. But so what I'm saying is that some of the recidivism that we've seen is have not been the ones that I explained earlier, the ones that get nollied and expunged. Uh, it, it's a mixture of, of a couple different thing, a couple different um, types of residents uh, that are there right now. But in the end, uh, our hope is to do, to get everybody in through nolly and expungement proceedings to try to decriminalize the actual charge itself when they come in. I hope that explains that. 
Um, Hallie, you've got your you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so can a person do this program as many times as yes. like come in? It's not, you know, oh, you had your shot and you came back. Is this the many answer to your question is yes. Uh, but we have had to turn down a couple um, already um, because when they were in the program, they weren't um, active actively actively participating in the program if that makes sense so like in group therapy or individual therapy they weren't active participants meaning they were they weren't giving what the mental health cooperative thought would be the appropriate level of participation in the actual program so but yet to answer your question yes we want we if they come back through the system they can definitely qualify to come back in for sure okay okay um, Anna, um, you're next. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being with us today and for taking yeah. our questions. Um, I had, so what COVID-19 measures are you taking uh, for the facility to ensure that everybody is safe? And I had another question and I'll probably follow up as soon as I remember it. Um, but that's that's my first one. Sure, yeah. Everybody is, um, when they come in there, you know, the, the, when the arrests come in, their actual temperatures are taken. Uh, on the front end, all of our um, staff that's there um, have their temperature taken in when they come in. Uh, masks are required in the behavioral care center. Um, uh, we most, if not most of the res, most of the employees there have had their vaccinations um, as well. Um, but uh, anytime we haven't, knock on wood, we haven't had any a resident yet uh, test positive for um, COVID, which is a good thing, obviously. Um, but yeah, we definitely um, take precautions uh, as, as it relates to if they're uh, having a, if they were to have any kind of like fever or, uh, or any kind of issues, obviously medical staff is there and then we would take precautions as far as isolation. Um, hope that answers your question. Uh, I have a follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, so I'm curious, what exactly are, so what are the the men, mental health criteria to qualify for this program? Like, are there specific um, disorders that, that um, you will only accept or like, is it more, is it, is it more broad? Like, is it kind of like anything from anxiety to bipolar disorder or schizophrenia? Like, is there a spectrum? Do you understand my All question? All three of those. All three of those? Okay. All three of those, yes. I'm not a clinical person. Like I said, the mental health cooperative is over the clinical functions of the behavioral care center. Uh, but I will tell you um, all three of those, they have, um, you know, obviously the individuals that come over here, come over to the behavioral care center have to have to want to be on medication uh, uh, or be receptive to medication and they have to volunteer to come over to the behavioral care center. Um, but I have, um, you know, there's been individuals over there with all three of those uh, multiple personality disorders. Uh, um, but yeah, there, there is, uh, it just depends what your, I guess, what your acuity level is. You know, there's some individuals that come in to the, um, into the jail that might be, you know, SPMI, the severely proficiently mentally ill that just can't function uh, in a therapeutic uh, environment. So they're, they're kind of looking for individuals who, who will su succeed in that type, that type of environment or receptive to it. I hope that Thank answers you. your question. Yeah. It does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, uh, back to you. There we go. So many clicks. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious as to the the demographics um, of the folks that are referred to the behavioral health care or behavioral care center. Sorry. Um, and versus the um, folks that are in that are not in that. So just like gender, race, socioeconomic status, just. Um, I wish I had some data in front of me, um, but we we have had um, individuals with disabilities, um, vision disabilities, loss of limb. Um, we've had uh, transgender uh, individuals uh, too, in fact. 
Um, so we're, we're, as far as the, the diversity, I mean, there's a wide uh, range of di diversity there. Um, so that there, everyone is uh, looked at, um, obviously on the front end, and if they're uh, receptive to to coming over, then we definitely want them want them to come over. So, Jennifer, follow up. Um, I mean, not really. I think it's probably well, yes, but I don't think it could be answered uh, during this meeting. But I was just looking for more of like a percentage, right? So if in the in the jail population that is not involved in this program, it's you know. 20% women and 80% men, but in the uh, behavioral care center, like it's completely switched, right? It's 80% women versus 20% men. Um, just like that kind of information. Gotcha, and that, that's, that's uh, I'm almost certain that's part of our outcome measures, um, Jennifer. And uh, I, I, I wrote that wrote that down, but we what we've experienced so far, we have obviously two sides, we have a, a 30 male beds and 30 female beds. Right now, we're pretty split in the middle. I mean, there's a total of 11 people in there right now. There's six males and um, five females. So that's kind of where, where we're at right now as far as gender. All right, so um, everybody keep notes of that because um, I'm gonna have some follow-up questions, but I'm gonna go to Hallie next. Um, and I saw your dog walking around, Hallie, you're kind of scary. If you need help, let us know. Okay. Um, okay, so two questions and they're they're completely different. So one, um, do you ever find, because the length of stay, the longest is 30 days, correct? Yes, correct. So do you ever find someone that comes in and they're maybe like they need a longer stay? Do you, can you, what do you do with them, I guess, is my question. Someone with like such severe. Um, we haven't ran into that yet, Haley, um, where someone needs more. And I think a lot of that is um, the acuity level on the front end that I talked about earlier is the, the, the mental health intake screeners um, and the, and Lacey Monday look at the individuals to see what kind of treatment, uh, what kind of treatment level that they're at and what they need. Um, and a lot of times your misdemeanor charges don't carry a very long uh, sentence, um, sentence anyway. Um, but we don't, um, ha we have not run into the fact that so far, I mean, obviously we might run into where, where a person's acuity level uh, jumps for whatever reason uh, and that they need a, a longer stay. Um, we haven't run into that yet. Do you, and this is not my second question, but that's just a follow-up to that. Do you know, and you might not, but do you know what happens to those individuals who like maybe don't qualify for the 30 length stay or 30 day length stay and like, you know, on that front end of the intake, like where they go? Yeah, the individuals go through the, obviously the, the judi ju judicial system. And as most of you guys know, um, they, um, uh, we have a mental health court. Uh, so individuals, some, in, some of those individuals uh, get onto the actual mental health court and to kind of follow up with what you were saying, as far as do they need, you know, longer, a lot of the providers that were, that we release individuals to, uh, they go to providers like Buffalo Valley and, um, you know, to get, if that makes sense. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting their, Yes, some people need more, and that's why the why the discharge planner sets them up uh, for uh, certain providers that that give them extended or you know wraparound services once they're done there at the behavioral care center. Okay, thank you. Um, and my second question is about expungement, and um, I think it's just kind of like two on my brain today because we were talking about it at work today. Um, but what? Like, what are the biggest barriers that you've seen to expungement um, with people that have come in through the behavioral care center? We haven't received um, any um, barriers. Um, public, the Kyle Morris, the public defender, 
uh, goes through the expungement proceedings with the clerk's office. And we haven't had we haven't had any, you know, obviously expungements in some some aspects take time because like I mentioned earlier, um, takes time, meaning backing the in information or expunging the information out of the out of the systems like uh, the TBI or I'm sorry, Metro Records Division. Uh, that's where the expungement gets sent to and then Metro Records uh, fingerprint division sends it to the TBI who also sends it to the FBI so it takes that part of it takes some time but I haven't ran into any barriers yet on individuals where that process is not working okay thank you Ella you good yeah okay. all right uh, Anna back to you um, so I have some follow-up questions about how, I, I, I don't think I'm really understanding how they get there in the first place. So um, are they, so are these individuals currently like in our DCSO jail and then transferred to the behavior unit or are our are, are officers dropping them off at the unit if they see them fit, one. And then two, um, there, you said that there are only 11 people inside of the facility right now and then there are 30 beds, is that correct? Or are there, or are there 60 beds with, 30 male and 30 female um, uh, like wings, I should say. So if that is the case, why aren't there more people? Because I'm pretty sure there's more than 11 people that are inside of, inside of our jails right now, um, especially on pretrial. So I'm just wondering why, why aren't there more people inside of this facility? Okay, the first question, um, yes, the, the individuals come from the, the downtown detention center um, after arrest, um, and they get transported from the detention center to the behavioral care center. So that's how they, you know, that's how they uh, come over to us um, after obviously the review that's done with the, 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 the um, district attorney, uh, public defender, um, mental health cooperative, and myself. And to answer your question is yes, there are a lot of individuals that are incarcerated. And yes, we have 30 male beds and 30 female beds, um, a total of 11 that are that are in there incarcerated right now. Um, but the there are only we 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 research every day like individuals that are incarcerated to see if they meet the the criteria. Um, I don't have the statistical information in front of me right now, but you know obviously felony charges do not um, qualify someone to come over to the behavioral care center. You have to have a, a misdemeanor charge. That's one of the, the main criteria. A very large percentage of the misdemeanors that come in through booking either get out on pretrial screening services or they get out on bond. So we, we rarely get an opportunity sometimes to get our, I don't want to say get our hands on them, but to, to help individuals because they get out before they get out on bond or they get out on pretrial before they have the uh, ability to um, see what we have to offer. Um, and the, the, the other individuals, we screen everyone that's incarcerated. Lacey Monday goes through individuals, like I said earlier, um, that might be convicted misdemeanors. Uh, so we bring them, those individuals over when we can, if they obviously meet the criteria, one, the, the charge criteria, and then two, the actual mental health um, capacity. Um, but I, I mean, I can get, I can work on some, some stats for you to try to help help explain that better uh, yes please um and one more follow-up and then i'm and then I'll, I'll let someone else go um why are felony charges not accepted in the facility yeah that's just something that uh they decided to do um early on uh it's one of the things that the sheriff uh decided was that he wanted to, to qualify just just felony charges and then um, also the district attorney, Glenn Funk, uh, he, he was, uh, he said the same thing. Uh, we do look at domestic charges. Um, and we also I'm trying to think what the other charges, um, we look at DUIs as well. Um, district attorney, um, district attorney looks at, at both of those. There's a lot of domestics where, um, an individual with a mental health condition uh, might be living with their mother or their father or their brother or their sister or their grandparents uh, and there's an episode at the house and the individual gets arrested on a domestic and 
the family just wants to see the individual get help. So that's one of the reasons why domestic violence, uh, some domestic violence cases, obviously the district attorney looks at the looks at the actual um, charging instrument to figure out exactly what's going on. And obviously she calls the victim uh, in the cases um, to, to decide whether or not the individual is a good fit for over there. But the district attorney, Glenn Funk, and the sheriff decided early on that felonies uh, felonies wouldn't be uh, able to come over. So I hope that answers it. Anna? Good. Uh, it, it does, thank you. So, um, Eric, let me ask you to do this. Um, and I was looking because I had the same questions that Hannah had on. I had three questions and she asked them all. But I'd like to go back to um, maybe for everybody's benefit. And obviously, you've got Keita on the call. It's a former public defender. Uh, Amanda's on the call. Um, would you, could you walk, particularly for people who don't, normally do this and we've got some folks on here who have not been to a jail docket don't exactly understand how this all works um because i i'm now a little confused about when those people get diverted over to your center could you walk us through basically from the time uh, i guess a, a police car pulls up with an individual to what that individual goes through and how they end up finally being diverted to your center. Do they end up in the general jail population for a little while before they're screened? How does all, can you walk us through so people actually know how that works? Yes, I sure can. Um, yeah, they, they, they do uh, wind up in general population. Um, obviously, our, like I told you guys earlier, our review that with the district attorney and the public defender happen, happens at 7.30 in the morning. Um, so obviously, individuals that get arrested at you know 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, they might not hit that review until the next day. So yes, the answer to your question is uh, yes. They they end up in general pop. Like we we uh, received two females today that were on the review this morning that got arrested yesterday, and they were already obviously in general pop out at the female facility, out of the southeast uh, co complex off of Harding. So they were they were out there, and then they they got transported after the public defender uh, talked to them about the program, and they agreed to come over to the program. They were transported from the uh, female facility to the behavioral care center um, downtown. Okay, let me um, I may throw some questions as you're going through this. Okay, so you're talking about seven thirty in the morning, then like nine o'clock in the morning. What happens on a Saturday or a Friday night if somebody gets picked up? Are they in the are they in the uh, the general population at the jail um, for two days, and yeah, then they're correct. looked at? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, correct. Yeah, there's no. I mean, it, it's one of the things that uh, part of the program. The way the way it's set up is the the reviews app happen Monday through Friday. So generally, if the individual is incarcerated over the weekend, uh, and they they they'll find they'll wind up on the review on on Monday. Um, so. You know, we're we're looking through some things to try to figure out how we can, uh, th you know, try to help more more people. But when you're doing the when the when you're doing the reviews during the day, um, and I'm not not excluding not because during the day when the d district attorneys and the public defender and the people that work for them uh, are in the, the the Birch Building during the day, uh, we we get referrals from court. Uh, during the day. So it's it's something that happens uh, that we're able to help people during the day as well. But, uh, you know, in the evening hours, uh, you know, if an individual gets arrested, uh, like at this time of day or in the evening hours, they wouldn't, uh, and, they, and they don't, like I said earlier, they don't bond out or get out on pretrial, uh, they'll wind up on the review the next day. So we're, we're working through some things, Vice Mayor, to try to figure out how we can capture more, help more people. Okay, uh, so, um, all right, so let's take an example of somebody who gets um, picked up at 7.30 p.m. on a Friday evening, okay? They mm -hmm. come in. When is the assessment done that draws it to the attention of your Monday 7.30 review? It's when done is the at, assessment? Yeah. It's okay. done at 7.30. 
Yeah, we have, like I said earlier, we have 24 seven uh, mental health intake screeners. So they'll, they'll wind up, they'll uh, put the individual on the actual um, uh, list uh, at 7.30 Friday night. Okay, so, somebody, so when, they get, when they come into the facility, they're mm -hmm. assessed, they're processed and everything else, and they're assessed right there on the spot. And somebody yes. makes a determination, the screeners make a determination that this individual may need mental health services, behavioral health services. Is that, is that when the decision is made and it, it immediately goes on a list? It's not going to be reviewed for a couple of days, but it's on that right. list. Yeah, it's on okay. that list. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and is that person given any different type of treatment at that point or are they put in the general population? And Keita, you may know this as well. What, what happens to that individual? I, and I'm asking either one. Eric, what happened? Yeah, they're to they're they're put on it. They're they're obviously put into the system that the mental health cooperative uses. So they're identified as having a mental health condition. So they can do follow up if they're they go into general pop. They can do follow up at that time when they get into general pop. But Akita, do you want to follow up? If they come in and they have an episode, then they'll put them in the safe room. True. Well, I guess that was part of my question was, if they are in need of mental health treatment when they come in, are they getting any mental health treatment for, the, if they come in on Friday night at 730, are they getting any type of behavioral health treatment for that? It's actually longer than a 48 hour per period. It's, it's yeah. what, 48 hours plus 12. What happens? Right, unless uh, mobile uh, crisis is called. Yeah, unless mobile crisis is called. You know, if, if it's an episode that that would require that, obviously the jail would call mobile crisis and someone from mental health would come in after hours. But like I said, we have we have intake uh, screeners there 24 um, seven master level uh, intake screeners. So um, the assistance would be there for sure uh, during the during the during the intake process for sure. OK, so let me ask you this part. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you're mentioning that, uh, okay, so they're picked up on a 7, 7.30 on a Friday evening. They're screened. It's determined that they would be available uh, or they, they're they a potential candidate for the program, but between Friday at 7.30 and Monday morning at 7.30, uh, they may come out of the system, right? I mean, they may make uh, whatever uh, bail is set or whatever. So you may never get a chance to actually have a chance to to review those individuals on Monday at 7:30. Correct. Yeah, because we don't. Uh, the way the program was set up, the district attorney uh, and the public defender has to be involved in the in the actual process itself. So, yeah, they would they would definitely be there till till Monday. Okay. So, and I I thought Anna was going there with this question, and it was, um, who are the individuals that make it that long? Who, who are, are they individuals who don't have the money to pay yeah. to make bond? Who are the only ones that are, are lasting that long to, the, to get to that 7.30 a.m. review on Monday? And Anna was going to say something. Anna, I really did think that's where you're going with your question. No, that, that, that's exactly where I was going. Yeah. Yeah, there, to answer your question, there aren't many that are left over that don't get out on pretrial or that don't, that don't get out on... Um, um, on bond, a lot of the individuals and a lot of the individuals that that have come in through the behavioral care center are homeless. Uh, so that might be a homeless individual that uh, winds up staying in there until Monday. We've had that a couple different times. So, and I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but I think the question would be, um, and again, I, I, I'm, part of this is trying to understand how to make this process work better. But if an individual comes in, um, it sounds like um, few people uh, like on a Friday night are making it all the way to Monday. Um, most people are gonna get out. Is there, are, is there a view process going on to go, wait a minute, we're, we're missing out on a number of people that actually might benefit from the services. And I know you, you may not necessarily be able to hold them, but we're missing people that may benefit from the services, but they're 
getting out long before we actually even get a chance to talk to him. For sure. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things that we're, we're, you know, obviously trying to wrap our, our brains around, um, uh, vice mayor that that a lot of individuals are getting out on bond we have you know Lacey uh keeps track of all the statistical information that i could share with the group uh and it's basically in a pot you know a, a pie graph it shows you um who we're missing basically the ones the individuals that you're talking about um and maybe i could share it with the group um that so that you all could see um who is um Who's being missed and the majority of the individuals that are being missed are the ones that are getting out on bond or are getting out on on pretrial is a very large number but if it if it helps i can i can send the latest um statistical information that we have to this group um i i'm more than willing to do that i think sure. that would be helpful um yeah, anna sure. uh, anna's got a follow-up question hi um i was wondering are there any so like, so would the BCC be able to administer services or at least have some resources available to those that have been released, like any type of counseling or, or would that be more of a star and mobile crisis type of deal? Yeah, I think that would be more of like a like a, a wraparound service. We don't, um, we don't do services. We don't um, provide services um, after release. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, follow up. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if this is more of just like a thing to think about or, um, but as I'm listening to something that sounds initially like a really, really good idea, I'm also thinking about the fact that in order to engage in a program that would help me and would also remove a charge, right? So if it's a, a mental health issue and you know, giving me a misdemeanor and having me pay fines and stuff is not the solution, right? But then I have to engage in an inpatient treatment program which means that I lose hours at my job, which potentially puts me at risk to lose my housing. So it's just I, many layers, right? Um, so it, on one hand, this is a really great idea. On the other hand, there's the potential to put people who need the help at risk, right? Because they might have to decide, do I lose my housing or do I not get this misdemeanor charge, right? Um, I don't know what the answer is. That's why we're all here today, right? Is to, to do that. But that's just something that as we were talking it through, just kind of started marinating um, in my brain as we were discussing like, you know, if, if I have financial resources and I have access to, um, an attorney or I understand the process, I can get out of jail because I don't want to sit in jail for, for three days, right? Um, but then I also miss an opportunity to get access to treatment. Um, so I don't know if that part of the answer is something more adjunct, um, some other kind of referral process or whatever, but um, just some, some things that start floating around. So I know there's not an answer. It's just more like a things I was thinking about. Uh, I'm going to write that down though, Jennifer. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure again, this is, this might be some statistical information that we have already. Um, but I know that the um, discharge planner, uh, Courtney, I know she, she tries to, she, she basically, if the individuals, she helps the individuals find jobs, if that makes sense. So like she uh, does, tries to get them applications and different things like that. But I'm wondering if we have a, a, a stat on individuals who come through, who have come through the behavioral care center, who who have have jobs or don't have jobs. Um, I know that we've had we've had a few that have come through that have jobs. Um, one, in fact, that had a episode at the airport and got arrested, and he was from Wisconsin, and he was a realtor, uh, but he spent 12, 10 days at the behavioral care center. Um, but got the treatment that he that that he desperately needed um, and that had never received before in his lifetime. 
Um, but he was able to get his charge nollied and, and expunged and obviously get back to Wisconsin. Um, but that was just one example of an individual who, who had employment, you know, where he had to call his, his boss and um, there in Wisconsin and, and explain to him what was going on. But I will write that. That's another thing I'm going to write down to try to see if I can see if that's a, a stat that we currently keep. Jennifer, uh, I, think, I think you speak to the, the actual problem in the criminal justice system where we have a system that um, we have a two-tiered system. We have a system that operates for people that have money and then a system for people that don't have money. Because if you have access to money and to resources and you find yourself arrested and you have mental health issues, you have the money and you have the resources to get the treatment that you need outside of jail versus someone who does not have money and doesn't have those resources. We are digging them deeper into a hole because in order for them to get the necessary treatment, they could possibly lose jobs. They could possibly lose housing. And that really just exasperates someone's mental health condition um, so, you know, you, you spoke to the problem that, you know, that we see on a regular basis. And so the question is that how do we, how do we, you know, level this, you know, how, you know, what, what is done to have this great opportunity for people to get the help that they need without having to be in jail and without having to, you know, look at having to lose homes and jobs and children and all of those other things that could possibly make their mental health worse in the long run. So, you know, so, I mean, I get that this is a great program and, and, and then we're talking about misdemeanors and, you know, we've heard where a lot of people, particularly with misdemeanors are getting out on pretrial, they're making bond because the bond is really low. And so there's not a lot of people that's able to take advantage of this, but we're not allowing people that have felonies to take advantage of this. And those are the ones that are sitting in jail pretrial that aren't able to make bond. And they have mental health issues to the same degree as someone that's charged with a misdemeanor. And so I'm just a little, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little confused as to, you know, if, why, why it is that, that people that have felony convictions are not able to take advantage of this program when we see that, you know, people that have the misdemeanor offenses are getting out of jail and are not really able to take advantage of this program. So Eric, can you answer? Um, so I know it was a decision made of kind of a- five Yeah, it was an upper level but, kind of decision that was made by uh, district District Attorney Glenn Funk. Um, so that would be a, a question that need, would need to be posed to him to start accepting felonies, basically, because we've been, our, the directive we got from, from them was that felonies are not, uh, are, are not part of the, uh, to be accepted into the Behavioral Care Center. So I mean, and, and a, I know that that wasn't your decision. You just happened to be on the call. Right. So I, you know, <laughs> the question to you. But I guess so. Is it something that that you guys could do at the at the Behavior um, Health Center after it's been open for a year, and you have your data of the people that have been able to take advantage of this program? And if it's not the number that you guys would like for it to be, simply because we're talking about misdemeanors, and like you said, people you know, a pre-trial, then they make bonds. Can, is somebody willing to, you know, talk to Glenn um, and to be like, hey, like, this is a good program. This is what we're offering. But because we're only, you know, allowed to have, you know, people that have misdemeanor offenses in this program, people are not really getting the benefit that they could be getting. And we have all of these other people that are here that have felony charges that are having to be screened and, you know, with MTMHI and do all of these other things. And, you know, and, and, you know, here, you know, you have a 30 beds for men, 30 beds for women, and you have 11 people on each side. And so, you know, yeah. you know, it's just that, you know, that I, I guess for me, it's just like that after a year reevaluating the numbers and saying like, Hey, you know, can we like think about this because we really want this program to be a success. And, with the way that we are allowing people in right now, you know, people are not really being able to take full advantage of it. Yeah, I, I yes, I agree. And and part of part of the the part of what we're looking at, and I'm sure that we'll, like you said, after a year or so to 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 figure out exactly who who can 
who we can uh, help out more. Uh, I part of the part of the problem was that you know um, we looked at we're we're hoping to look at um, probation violators. Um, a lot of a lot of the individuals that are in, incarcerated right now are um, uh, probation violators, and then some of the you know felony charges they get into the judicial system. I think part of and I'm I'm speaking maybe for Glenn, um, but you know part of the part of part of the what they what he was trying to do is try to keep this out of the ju judicial system itself. He was trying to handle the the misdemeanors, and I think that's why he he wanted to start with misdemeanors because it's something that his office can do. His office can 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 with the help of the public defender's office, I guess, before the the individual gets uh, you know, uh, put on a docket and in front of a judge, the, the court date can get pushed out and we can help that individual. Felony cases might be a little different. I'm not an expert on um, what happens in the courthouse, um, obviously, but we also want to try to help out uh, in the long run. I think we really want to try to help out probation violators. Um, but of course, pro you know, with the probation violators, um, again it's 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 it would it would include it would have to include the judicial system or the the judges um the 12 judges that that we have over there to get them involved so we were trying to try not to involve the um individuals in the actual court process trying to handle it before they actually get to court and that might be a, a couple of the, the the snags as it relates to felony, and then uh, in the future, I'm I'm really hoping that we can try to help probation violators as well. The average length of stay in the in our jails for a probation violator is 56 days. So if if there's some way we could help out an individual who is on uh, in jail on a probation violation um, for whatever charge, if we can try to Try to help that length of stay, um, maybe decrease that length of stay. Um, but that is just throwing that out there. That's something that that we're we're looking into. So to try to help our numbers, because we realize that, you know, unfortunately with the COVID and and obviously this time of year, maybe not today because it was so nice outside, but um, it's a little cooler and there's not as many individuals um, coming in into jail, which I'm happy for. I don't, you know, I'm not I. I'm very happy that not in the, a whole lot of people are getting arrested because I, I don't like to see that either. So, but anyway, okay, I'm babbling so on now. Question about the, the probationers, um, because one of the things that you said is that the benefit of going through this program is that people are able to get their charges expunged. Um, but if, if, if you guys are taking probationers in there, then obviously they're not able to get the benefit of that because they've already pledged to something. So, yeah you know, when you're talking about probationers and then, you know, we know that a very high percentage of probationers are in for technical violations as well too. Um, and the fact that they are in custody for 50, 60 days on a technical violation is a whole nother issue that you don't have anything to do with. But I mean, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if you're trying to get probationers in there, like what is the incentive for probationers to, to be in this program when they really don't get the full I guess of the program? The yeah, the main the main I think objective there um, uh, is that if an individual, uh, you know, after after the, let's just for instance say they come over and they're a probation violator and we we are able to help them and basically dissolve the probation basically, um, meaning that, that that they're no longer on the hook for probation. Uh, that individual goes out and that individual gets gets pulled over. Um, that individual gets pulled over uh, in the in the future. That that individual might be able to go to the crisis crisis treatment center, right? Versus having to come in because they're violating their probation. So I think that was part of the concept of trying to help. Uh, you know, the probation violation is a lot of the individuals um, that have a mental health episode in in public. Uh, they, the police department sometimes doesn't have a choice but to bring the individual to jail because they have a probation violation warrant out for their arrest. So I think the idea there was to try to, in the future, try to uh, not have that probation violation there if an individual in the future gets, gets has a mental health crisis uh, in the community. So, and so, hey, uh, what, just, hey, 
Kate, oh. Kate, apparently I'm being told we have a hard stop. Okay. Um, so I think, um, but the questions are very relevant and I think we're gonna have to do this again the next meeting. We, we can't stop and we may wanna include somebody from the DA's office to talk about how the decision was made, okay? So, um, and I hate to stop everybody because the questioning is good, but uh, Eric, we may want you to come back. Amanda, Keita, hold on to your questions. Um, we're gonna, we'll stop for tonight. We meet again in two weeks, but this is relevant and your questions are very good. Um, so thanks everybody. We're on back again in, in two weeks and Keita, just hold on to your questions. Okay, sorry to cut, cut you off. Thanks everybody. Good, good meeting. Uh, very important. Thanks Eric for being on. Thanks. Here. I'll send that those stats out to everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.